Thank you all for coming today uh, to Cybersecurity for Startups, How to Protect Systems While Pursuing Growth. Uh, my name is Mike Andrews. Uh, if you have any questions or uh, useful experiences that you want to share as we go through the slides that you think the others would find useful, please uh, do so, so it's an interactive experience. We'll try not to make it go as long as it has other times because it's the last session of the day. And that's always a good time to end early. So thanks for coming. A uh, little about me. So I started out on active duty in the Air Force 20 year, 20, a little over 20 years ago, uh, doing telecom and IT stuff. Uh, three years later, I became an Air Force civilian while at the same time joining the Air National Guard to continue the uniform service, uh, still serving to this day as a cyberspace operations officer. Uh, in 2019, I came out here to Vegas uh, to become a Lockheed Martin employee at Nellis, leading three classified programs related to the F-35 fighter, fighter jet platform. Uh, and then I started my cybersecurity consulting company, Yastis, in 2019, went at it full time in 2020 in the heart of COVID and uh, still doing that today. Uh, so this briefing is going to focus on how to balance three things. Uh, number one is the fact that hackers are actively targeting startups and other small businesses in general. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. One of them is there's a perception that, that startups don't care as much about cybersecurity, haven't invested as much in the cybersecurity. So pretty obvious, a criminal mindset would say, let's just target what, what's ever easiest. You don't have to go rob Fort Knox where they keep the gold if you could just get, get the same results by hitting, hitting, hitting an easy target. Uh, along with that is the fact that cybersecurity and privacy laws and regulations are changing every day. Uh, they do vary industry to industry and geographical location to location throughout the world, whether it's uh, the payment sector or the healthcare sector, or even in the United States, we have privacy laws that uh, are now being added one by one to model how they do it in Europe. The first one was uh, California, and, and then in 2023, Colorado and Virginia came on board. There's some more in 2024. Uh, in, in about six months from now, there's like six or seven more states coming out with it. And it kind of makes it a big headache for companies because you have to take all this into account if you, if you have customers in those states. There are some exceptions for smaller businesses, like if you have less transaction volume, but it, it's just a lot to consider. And then the third leg that we're going to talk about balancing is the one that startups are really invented for, which is to focus on their products and services that customers around the world want. So one of these is hard. Uh, two of them is really hard. Three of them together is uh, really, really hard. So, But we'll talk about some common sense ways that uh, we can deal with this without uh, spending all our you know, fundraised money on uh, this stuff. Because there's, there are ways to make a difference every day. So uh, this here, as you can see, this is a successful startup in the picture because they're all looking at the computer monitor uh, and doing some work. Uh, but this is the top five ways that startups generally get hacked. So number one is phishing, which is how people get hacked in general. About 85 to 90% of the time, uh, a cyber attack starts with a phishing incident, which is just uh, a human-based human error, generally either clicking on a bad link or opening a bad attachment that has active malicious code in there. So that's number one. Uh, after that, we have weak passwords and two-factor authentication policy. Uh, so with the weak passwords, uh, if something's like one, two, three, four, five, six, or A, B, C, D, E, that's really simple for a hacker to target. Uh, the software that's free on the internet can, can help a 15 year old get into your system if that's your password. To go along with that, two factor authentication policy. So if you have good two factor authentication, that could make up for your weak passwords in many situations. But if you have either no two factor authentication or the weak two-factor authentication, meaning generally something that's phone number based, call or text, that can be is uh, SIM swapped capable. It's, it's pretty risky, so it's better to use uh, some stronger stuff, which we'll talk about a little later. And then after that, we're seeing unpatched and misconfigured software. So uh, we know we have to have software to do cybersecurity, things like antivirus, something capable of audit logs so you can see what's going on on your systems. But they also have to be set up properly and you also want to make sure that you're only using products that the vendor is still supporting. Because vendors like Microsoft, they generally only support a given version for a set period of time, and then they stop. 
because one, uh, they can't do it forever. They want, to, they want you to buy something new. Uh, fortunately, in this regard, the software as a service model where you pay every month, it might seem annoying to pay, but the benefit you're getting is that those vendors are more likely to keep patching your stuff and you don't have to worry about them dropping the uh, you know, support of it. So that's a good part of paying every month. After that, this is a hard one, third-party cybersecurity risk. Why is it hard? Well, if you have a partner and it's like a big payment processor or a bank, you might think, well, our data is safe with them. They're a really big company. They probably put hundreds of millions of dollars into that. When a lot of times it can be a black hole, you don't really know what's happening. And uh, those, those incidents are really hard to deal with because in your mind, you feel like you did nothing wrong. In most cases, you didn't. Uh, so that, that's another one to consider. Uh, and then lastly on this list is insider threat. That's some, either an employee or a contractor, or it could be a third party provider in some instances that are misusing your data, whether it's on purpose or by accident. Uh, so now we're just gonna talk about some potential impacts of bad cybersecurity. So that could include getting hacked, or sometimes it doesn't, because sometimes you have bad cybersecurity which, uh, you know, it, it's not a good thing to have because a contract might call for it or, you know, a regulation might call for it. So ge generally speaking, uh, if, if your cybersecurity is not good, these are some of the impacts. So obviously you could experience system downtime. A lot of businesses, especially if you're working from home, you're heavily relying on your systems being there. And if you're not, uh, that can cause a major business disruption. It can cause your employees to be pretty much twiddling their thumbs, just waiting for your system to be restored. And there's a lot of uncertainty at that moment when the systems are down and, and customers are calling you on the phone saying, why is the system down? Is my data safe? I thought you said my data is going to be safe. So that's a hard one. Uh, along with this could come stolen funds, whether that's company funds or client funds, or maybe you just did a fundraising round and the investors just sent you the check and that's publicly available. So that's what makes a hacker want to target you. And then they get that big check and you can't use it to grow your company because it's gone. And that's not a good situation to deal with. Um, then you have data theft. So that could also be uh, company data. It could be client data. That's even worse, right? Because if it's company data, say you have a new company, that's not the worst thing in the world. You could, if you were good enough to start one startup, you could probably do it again. But if it's client data, you, you could really put, be putting these people in a bad situation. Uh, so. I mean, I don't know your mindset, but to me, that's even worse than, than your own data because we owe it to the people whose data we collect to protect it. Reputation harm. So if you go through a breach, people are going to be, everyone's going to be turning into a Monday morning quarterback saying, how did they happen? Like, why didn't they have strong two-factor authentication? Did they not have backups? And uh, unfortunately, a lot of companies don't. Um, and then... A lot of my clients, for example, they'll look into something like this. Like they'll come to me and they'll say, we're considering these three CRM platforms. Can you give me a write-up for each of them from a cybersecurity perspective? And then I'll do that. And they'll say, okay, well, we like them all, but we're gonna go with this one. So I know for a fact that it is hitting their bottom line. They're making less money uh, when they have something go wrong or that they're clearly lacking uh, with their cybersecurity. Uh, and then lastly on, of, of these five is lawsuits. So we live in a sue happy culture, whether it's right or wrong. In some cases it's right. In other cases, lawyers like to do it because a lot of times companies will just settle rather than going through a, a prolonged court battle that's very expensive. So the, the likelihood of your company experiencing that goes up dramatically in the instance of a breach or a known compliance flaw within your company. So look, this guy was bag over his head. Like this, it gets really embarrassing. But <laughs> these are just five more kind of impacts. But these are more externalities. These are like second and third order effects. Uh, I'd say a lot of times. So loss of current and future sales goes back into the reputation harm. You know, you want to grow the company. Uh, it's easier to do your cybersecurity early on before you get too big. That way, nothing, nothing bad happens that could, could potentially impact your reputation. Uh, loss of business partnerships. Uh, whether it's right or wrong, whether your company was it truly at fault or maybe you were just using a software uh, that ended up having a flaw, so a lot of times you'll see partnerships dissolve when that happens because people want to cut ties and point the finger and say, oh, that wasn't us, that was them, uh, we, we don't do business with them anymore. 
Because when things go wrong in business, you heard the, the saying, heads have to roll, for example. Uh, whether it's right or wrong, you want to hold someone accountable to, so it shows that you're taking things seriously. So sometimes that could result in a loss of a good business partnership that was working otherwise. Sometimes you might see your third party provider cancel on you. I've seen companies get told like, we're cutting your access off from the cloud, whether it's from AWS or the other place you see this a lot is with payment processors. So the bigger payment processors, they have risk departments. And if they think you're too risky as a customer, they're gonna cut you off. And then sometimes you could just go to the other payment processors because there's not only one, uh, but other times the word gets out that you're you know, lacking in this area and it makes it harder and then your rates go up and you just, it just becomes more of, more of a liability. Uh, another one is investor grievances. So a lot of startups, uh, even just small businesses that have investors, they're asking questions like, pretty, probably usually pretty basic, like you're tending to cybersecurity, right? And then what's the founder gonna say? Of course we are, why would we not? You know, we, we take this very seriously. We have a section on our website and the privacy policy that says we do security, we, we use best practices. And if, if it's not true, uh, investors probably don't like that. They might ask for their money back or they might just not invest in the future and then uh, it's just not a good thing. Uh, and then lastly here is regulatory penalties. We're, we're gonna get a little bit deeper into that uh, on the next slide, but uh, does anyone have any questions or relevant experiences to share from what we've discussed up to this point? Okay, cool. All right, so compliance. It's, uh, most people probably wouldn't say it's a fun area. You know, I actually enjoy it because when you have a policy, you can look and see what it says it's supposed to be done, and then you could just kind of make it happen. So I like that. Some people prefer more of the gray area. I like the black and white. Uh, and within compliance, uh, which is usually more business focused, you'll see the laws, different processes within the company, company policies, rules, guidelines, and regulations. They sound like the same thing. There are some defined differences. We'll save that for another date. Uh, but just wanted to give you guys some examples of general laws and regulations that you might see, as well as some sector-specific ones. So that's not all-inclusive. Uh, couldn't, we don't have enough time to talk about all of them out there, but just wanted to give you some, some insight into these. So the first one under general laws and regulations is the Federal Trade Commission, their consumer protection. So anyone familiar with the Federal Trade Commission, what they exist for? It's basically, you, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a broad mandate uh, for them to do what they do, but they, this also applies in cybersecurity and privacy. Um, so if you, like we talked about a minute ago, like if in your privacy policy, you have this great section about cybersecurity and you say we do encryption, we do these 10 things, you're safe. If that turns out to not be true, uh, it can get really ugly in a breach because the government, and a lot of investors and people in general are understanding that risks evolve every day in, in, uh, in cyber. Uh, there's new vulnerabilities exploited daily, it happens. But when it gets ugly is when it becomes obvious that a company didn't do their due diligence or they lied about something. They withheld information from investors, customers, and regulators. That's when it gets really ugly. That's why like, when I have a client engagement, one of the things I like to say is that you're getting immediate benefit by working with a company because you're showing some due diligence. You have someone to do it. You're not, you're not sitting there like this. So nice job. <laughs> uh, so the next one on this list is the CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act. And there are other states that have comparable versions of them. There are some exceptions to this, like for smaller businesses, like in California specifically, they have three qualifications for this. So it definitely applies only to businesses that are working with data of, of California consumers. But the three exceptions, uh, you have to have either be dealing with over 100,000 records uh, of California residents, or your business is getting 50% of its revenue from data related to California residents. Or the third one is that your business grosses over $25 million in revenue. So it probably doesn't apply to too many businesses around here, but it definitely could. I, that, at least that's the goal, right? So uh, 
in some ways it's good when you, when you get regulated because it means you're, you're big enough, right? Uh, next on the list is COPA, that, re that is related to child privacy protection. So if your business does, uh, if all your clients are 18 and up, you don't have to worry too much about this. It is something that you should address in your privacy policy and say, we only do business with uh, client consumers over the age of 18. If you're under the age of 18, please stop now or get a, uh, your parent or guardian to do this with you. It's kind of like one of those lawyer compliance type things, but it's important because if for every infraction of this, of you having the data of a user under the age of 13, there's a maximum fine up to $43,000 per infraction. And that's not all the names that are in your database, that's per user. So say you just had this happen to like just 10 minors, that could, that's potentially a $430,000 fine. Most businesses can't handle that or don't want to. And I, I say that just because that's the facts. In actuality, the government does use some common sense. And if they look at the matter and they tell it was just, you didn't do anything wrong, you weren't targeting them specifically, they might use some judgment. But like, like going back to what we talked about earlier, if you show a lack of due diligence or just a total disregard for what's right, they can hit you hard. You know, they could say basically in their, within their meetings, we don't want them to exist anymore. So we're gonna make them not exist with this fine right here. Here you go. So moving on to a few sector specific ones. We have the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act, which pertains to anyone that has a part in financial services. So whether it's a, a wealth advisor, a bank, an accounting company, you name it. If their primary business is money, they have to think about this. Uh, so what's included in that is the fact that you're expected to have a formal cybersecurity program that manages risk, including doing an annual risk assessment, auditing your systems, uh, things like vulnerability scans, having policies in place. And there are some other regulations that go into this. Like uh, I have some accounting clients and there's some IRS specific regulations, but it, it ties back into the gramm leach bliley Act since after all, they're a financial institution. Uh, the next one on here is, uh, you're probably familiar with whether it's from your own medical process at, at your doctor or maybe caring for a loved one, just HIPAA, which is related to healthcare uh, privacy you know, for, for patients, which it, if you're ever at your doctor's office or talking to them and they want to fax you something and you're like, why are you being a dinosaur? It's probably related to this. It probably means that they want to do whatever it takes to have a minimal requirement to do cybersecurity stuff and work with people like uh, me and, and the crew in the back over here. So if you didn't know, that's, that's a big part of that. And there are some fines that are, uh, could be levied for not doing that and uh, it's just not good for medical companies. And then last one here is the payment card industry data security standard, which pertains to any business that works with cards. And that's not just credit cards, it's also debit cards. So the requirements with that one really vary. Like if you're just a corner store with a card swiper, they expect you to do 30 questions, most of which will just say, our payment processor does that, we don't do that. And that's it, great. But if you're a bigger company, it gets more and more uh, up to payment processors, which have about 450 questions that they have to answer. And it gets really in depth and it can be a lot of money. And if you're a payment processor, you're almost, om almost certainly gonna have at least a few cybersecurity people on staff or be working with a, a service provider or consulting company uh, to handle that for you so you can focus on your business because there's a lot to that one. Anyone have any insight into these regulations or any business experience with uh, dealing with them? Sir? Uh, what's your question? Do you need to have insurance? So with, with these, that's a good question. And I was just talking about that recently. Right now, I, there's no mandate that I know of that says you must have cyber insurance. I could certainly see that coming in the future. Sir? So there is cyber insurance. I don't know how it relates um, to, to that. Oh, yeah. But, um, I can talk about that. You have um, cyber insurance. Um, so that is something to um, consider because we, what is Jesse James said? That's where the money is. That's where the money is. And so, yeah. Uh, if 
you know, people have all these advertisements saying, do we ever get e-commerce? Um, Amazon, you can make money, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. That's where the money is. Right. And you're encouraging people to work with you, and then they take those people's money going to you. Absolutely. I'll, I'll hear her, her, are you commenting on that or should I answer that first? Oh, I wanted to have your business insurance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so cyber insurance, it's, it's a challenging area because not many people understand it well. There's not a, really a set formula for calculating how much it will be. The general guidance is, well, it's, of course it's based on the risk and the industry of your business, but the general guidance is that if you're going to pursue cyber insurance, you should get 10 to 20% of your annual revenue. So say your business grosses a million dollars a year, you're going to want to get somewhere around $200,000 of coverage, maybe a little more. Um, and you can expect to pay like 3 to 5% of that amount. So if you're, if you're trying to get a million dollar policy, you're probably going to pay somewhere around five, dollars 6000 This is just for educational purposes, right? Yeah. You should add your account. Yeah. Absolutely, it's uh, it is a calculation. I've a lot, I've had a lot of clients ask about that, like say, can you figure it out? And I'll just say, um, well, you can tell me your revenue, or I don't need to hear it. Uh, I here's this little chart I've made for you to calculate it. And if you think this this is worthwhile in pursuing, I can help you contact some cyber insurance companies and work with it. Another reason I don't I don't love the process is because a while back I was doing some business development trying to build on partnerships, which is important in our industry. So I was reaching out to cyber insurance brokers and saying, would you like to work with us? We can help your, your, your potential customers figure out their true status of their cybersecurity. And then that way uh, it could be a better relation for you two. And what I got was basically like, let's not talk about this. And then after doing a lot of research and talking to people, they probably don't want that to happen because the way it works is when you go for cyber insurance, they ask you a certain number of questions and it almost benefits them if you don't know what to answer and you just say, we're good, we're good, we're good, we're good. Because when something happens, as part of the claims process, they say, we're going to verify your answers. Oh, you didn't really do that. Okay, well, we're not paying. So it's, it's kind of dirty. It just makes me kind of cringe just thinking about it, but that's... It is important to have, and I, I think there will be a mandate at some point because that just seems very mandate-ish, right? Like if you're a politician, that seems like an easy way out. Like let's just make them have insurance. So I would, I, I would bet money. It would probably be within two or three years we'll see something like that. Yeah. Do you have any insight into this? No, I'm just... just, so, just sounds like it. Yeah. So before you do that, so related to that, maybe you want to do that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And so when, when I saw, because I wasn't as familiar with California, so to me, that's, that's the US, U.S. and the state by state comparison. That because in California, it's a honey pot, right? Yeah. Honey pot. People yeah. want to do there, so you would want to know how to make sure that you are abiding by this impression. Absolutely. So you want to make sure to know if you fall within the thresholds that this will apply to you. There are some oddball stuff in there, like for instance, if GLBA, which we men mentioned here, applies to you, then CCPA does not, because California is confident that during your efforts to comply with GLBA, that you'll, you'll, you'll be good to go if you do that. So let's not do double work, which that's kind of smart. Um, but yeah, that, that, that is modeled after GDPR, which is from Europe, and now there's a separate one for the UK, since they broke off from Europe, even though it's kind of the same thing. And then California modeled theirs after Europe, and then we have Virginia and Colorado kind of modeled theirs after California. And there's a lot of different state ones. We'd probably all be better off if there was just a national one, but there's some, it's, there's some reasons that it can't or won't. Like the only federal government privacy regulation right now, it's called the Privacy Act of 1974, 
and that only pertains to government data. So like the, the, the stuff the military works with, Department of State, that applies to that, not, not your business's data. That, that's not related to that. So uh, just based on all my experiences uh, throughout my career and, look, and working with startups, uh, I came up with this list here of 10 ways to improve cybersecurity. It's not an all-inclusive list, but it's 10 ways to get the most bang for your buck and be able to make differences for the protection of your data without spending a lot of money, right? And let's, so we'll get started here. Just right off the bat, background checks and non-disclosure agreements. Is that a cybersecurity tool? Not exactly, but don't you think it's pretty important to your cybersecurity to know who is exactly accessing your systems? That's an access control. If you have someone that has 50 felonies and you didn't check their background, that could have been something you wanted to know. I mean, I believe in people having chances in life, but you at least should be doing some due diligence and figuring out who works at your company, right? Especially if you have sensitive data, because sometimes this is a requirement. And to go along with that, we have non-disclosure agreements. So if you don't want something to end up on LinkedIn or Twitter or on the, on the wall here, it doesn't hurt to have a non-disclosure agreement. The, the crew from the Free Cyber Clinic in, in their briefing a little while ago talked about having a non-disclosure agreement in place for their engagements in the community. And that's just really good practice because sometimes it, it does get into sensitive data and not only that, just sensitive information about what's happening within a business. So if you're a business owner and you haven't been tending to your cybersecurity, it's, it's probably a mess, right? Because an example I give is for runners, right? Like if you decide today that you're going to run and you plan to do a marathon in three or four months, you're probably not going to be doing that well. So if you make a commitment today to your cybersecurity and, and a crew like theirs comes in and looks at it, it's probably not going to be that great, but that's okay because you can fix it. That's why people like, like them exist to make improvements and it can be done in a manageable way. Um, so yeah, so moving on is just employee awareness training. Kind of like we're doing now. I mean, so different regulations require annual training, like the payment card industry data security standard says you should be training employees at least annually. A lot of, a lot of practitioners would say best practice is every six months or whenever you have a major change, it, like if you added a major piece of software, you should be giving them training on how to use that software, both for a functionality perspective and for a security perspective. If there are security features, they should understand how to use them, because if you don't provide training, you can't really expect them to know how to, to use it properly, right? Because they haven't used it before. Are people smart? Yeah, usually, but it helps if you just show people what to do, right? That's, that's all you can expect. And then with that, after the training, it's best practice to have them sign a user agreement to say, I agree to this stuff. It usually won't matter, but if something goes bad or employees decide to put your whole database on a hard drive and just have it at home, this would be the place where you could stop that and fire them and, or whatever you got to do and say, you agreed to not do this. Hopefully you never have to deal with that. But uh, Next one is just 100% usage of two-factor authentication. And ideally, that will be strong two-factor authentication, meaning either a hardware key or more commonly is a smartphone-based authentication method such as Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, or Authy, usually free. Uh, and they'll usually give you a, like a six-digit code or you can configure it differently, like if you want a shorter code. Or, or with that, uh, a lot of companies are using the push method uh, of where when you try to log in, it'll just come up and say like, go to your YouTube to confirm this transaction. Then you pull out your phone, you just click OK. Uh, with that, uh, you probably haven't heard of the term MFA fatigue. This is where hackers, they'll just keep blasting you like, hey, press OK, just press OK, like it'll stop. So if you've ever had to log in and press OK, a lot of times now you'll see like a two digit or four digit code pop up and so you can match your screen with your device so you know that, okay, this is related to what I'm working on here. This is not a hacker, this is, this is good. So that's good to set that up like that. Next one is data segmentation. Kind of like, to give you an example of, like it, look, let's talk about MGM for just a second. So when they were hacked and their gaming systems, their reservation systems, their reward systems were all impacted, that kind of tells a practitioner that maybe their segmentation wasn't that great. 
right? Because those hackers got into their system, they were moving around, they were sleeping on their couch, doing all sorts, wearing the shoes in the bedroom, you know, <laughs> all sorts of stuff they were getting around. So the best way to get around that is to segment your data. Uh, so say you have, say 10% of your data is sensitive, maybe keep that over here and have your staff that doesn't need to see that just over here. Don't, you only give access to the data that people need to do their job. That's called the principle of least privilege. You don't need to do any more. It's also good to put people into roles. That way when a, an employee gets hired, you could say, oh, well, they're on HR, great. So they need access to the HR role. You don't need to say, well, they need this, access to these 60 different areas. No, do, put a role in place. And, and that, that's how you can manage data segmentation pretty, pretty easily. Do you, you have something? Okay, cool. You look, you look fine. Oh. <laughs> uh, next one on here, minimizing system accesses. That's what, kind of what we just talked about. Just people don't need access, just, just don't give it to them. You, you know, it's easy. Do you have less requests if you give everyone access to everything? Sure, but you also have very poor security. So if you have to have the IT person just add someone to a group or whatever you gotta do, just, just add rather than, add when needed rather than all at once is, is all I'm saying. Um, so moving on is to just a little bit of automation. So for software updates, uh, we, we talked about it earlier, a lot of the software now is software as a service, uh, but typically if you go into the uh, options, the, config, the settings, you'll see you want to enable automatic updates. Um, that's usually good to do. I mean, sometimes there are areas that are a little more sensitive, like in the government, sometimes they evaluate the software updates to make sure it's not gonna break anything. But for a standard business, it's pretty safe to just click yes to that, uh, allow the software update, and then if anything goes wrong, you can typically just go back and what they do called roll it back to the prior version until you, it's, you know that it's not gonna break your systems to uh, apply that patch. So we wanna keep our systems patched, but we also wanna make them usable. That's why we call it risk management, not risk elimination. You know, you're not gonna be able to get rid of all risks. Uh, so the next one here is just automated backups. So depending on the sensitivity of the data and how, how often you need to have it available, like what, depending on what you promise to your customers, you might wanna have hourly backups or maybe weekly backups or maybe quarterly backups is okay. But whatever your business needs to be, to have assurance both for yourself and for customers that the data is gonna be there, that's how you wanna uh, address your backups. And if you can automate it, one, it takes the manual element out of it, so that's a good thing. But even if you do automate it, it is good to go back every once in a while and do a test of your backups to make sure you can pull from there when you need to. Because sometimes we've seen where a, a company is going to pull that backup when they need it and then it just doesn't work right. Like the system will tell you that it was doing the backup right, but there's just the restoral that isn't working. Sir? Well, just to your point, to make sure that you have restore point activated because yeah. you know, a lot of times it's not out of the, out of the box, restore is not always um, set up. Absolutely. So you just got to set it up at the, at the duration you need. And if you go back and just make sure it's still on, like go look at the settings. Because sometimes just it's software. It's not humans, right? Even AI, it's smart, but it's not perfect. Like ChatGPT, it can't spell very well, like when you generate images, <laughs> for example. Uh, so just go back every once in a while, make sure that box is still checked for automated backups, if that's what you're doing. Uh, the next one here is just automate those antivirus scans and remediation. So a good thing to do is to have your Microsoft Defender on and maybe you can set up an automatic scan for like 3 a.m. at a time where you and your employees probably aren't using the system. Because if you do it during the day, sometimes an antivirus scan can slow your computer down because it takes a good amount of processing power since it's going through hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of files. But if you do it at, when you're sleeping, then it's a win-win because your systems are, you're, you're checking to see what's going on. Uh, some software products allow you to do automatic remediation, meaning deal with it automatically. Like, ew, we found a, a bad file, let's quarantine it or auto delete. Uh, but if you need to be more careful about it, some bigger companies, they'll have it just kind of quarantined and then the, the, maybe the admins will either get a notification at that moment, like go in now and check, or maybe they'll just have a process Go in in the morning and just see what happened overnight. 
Um, and then next one is verify third-party cybersecurity. We talked about it a little earlier. Sometimes it can be really hard to know what's going on at a company that's not yours and, and you don't have insight. Because if you ask them, sometimes they'll give you the answer you want to hear because they want business. But some common sense things that we can do are to go to their site, just look at the security precautions that they, they mention, check to see what certifications they mention. A common one among like software companies, for example, is called SOC2. It's, a, it's overseen by the AICPA. That's, the, that's who oversees all the accounting people, the CPAs. It's kind of weird that they oversee cybersecurity, but they get credibility because it's an audit, right? They, they're good at audits, and this is, a lot of times, this is auditing. So companies will get that, and they'll generally list it on their website. So if you go to a soft, if you're comparing software, and one says that they have a SOC 2, and the other barely mentions cybersecurity, the one that mentions SOC 2 is probably better. Also, what, maybe if you're going to the cloud, or you're having some data processor do some aspects of the service for you, it's important to make sure that in the data processing agreement, essentially the contract, that they mention who is required to do what. Uh, it'll often be called a, sh uh, a share shared responsibility uh, arrangement. Essentially, there's some different terminology, but essentially they say all the things that they will do for you, and then the things that you, as the as the customer, will have to do. Because very often, even earlier today, I heard someone say, "Well, if you're in the cloud, you're fine." Well, it's kind of a unique topic because let's talk about AWS, for example. A company like theirs, they're doing security of the cloud. You're doing security, the customer is doing security in the cloud. The ex a, a, easy to see example, it's kind of like in your neighborhood. The police patrol your neighborhood, but they're not controlling the rooms in your house, right? So that's your job. If you don't want your kids getting the cookies, you lock the cookies away. So uh, there are a lot of good tools on the clouds. You just have to configure them and use them. Um, yeah. So if you do those two things, just see what certifications they have what, uh, and uh, get it in the contracts. For a small company, that's all you're realistically probably going to do. Bigger companies will have checklists that they'll send to them and make them answer 50 questions or five. I've seen hundreds of questions. It can get really elaborate. And some companies that are sent those will say, I'm not doing this. But sometimes it'll be a big enough contract that they'll say, okay, well, we'll do this. Yeah, this kind of sucks, but we'll do it. <laughs> so... Uh, and then last thing on this list is to maintain an incident response plan. That doesn't have to be anything elaborate, but essentially, what are you going to do if something goes wrong? Because even if you have great cybersecurity, things can always go wrong. Threats evolve every day. And this plan would simply say, like, what do we do? What, what system do we restore first? Who do we call? Do we call our partners? Do we call our investors? Is there a specific consultant that we need to call? Do we need to report this to any regulators? Because most states, including this one, requires that if you have a data breach that affects like consumer data, that you have to report it to the attorney general's office. Uh, sometimes it's within a set period of time. So it's important to have a plan that says all this because when your systems are going crazy or you can't even get in your systems, that's not the time to be having your phone out on Google trying to figure all this stuff out because you're going to be stressed. And if you have that plan, you just pull it out and use it. And it makes things so much easier. So it's, it's often a requirement, but it's also just the best practice. It, you want to simplify whatever you can bef before you need to. You just want to be prepared. And this list of 10 items, I think, is something that anyone in here can do within a day or two. Uh, some of it's common sense. You may already be doing a lot of these. Maybe, maybe all of them. Who knows? Um, yeah. So how's my, how can my company help any, anyone around here? We're happy to offer a free cybersecurity plan to essentially ask, uh, like, how big is your company? What industries do you operate in? Are you cloud or, or on-premise or maybe a mix? And a handful of other questions. And then it can simply just review your answers and send over a plan to show, like, all the regulations that apply and uh, maybe some templates and how to handle this throughout the year. Like, if, you, if your industry requires an annual risk assessment, I could just put that in the plan. And then you can either do it yourself, because a lot of times when a regulation says that you have to do risk assessments, it's not telling you, use this model and do it you know, th at this date. It's, it's a framework, right? These are risk management frameworks. 
A framework is not a law. That just means here's something that you can look at and tailor to your needs. So I can help with that happily. Uh, and then free employee awareness training. Say you have a company and you, and you, you want the uh, employees to use the systems right. I'm happy to just reach out anytime and just say, hey, give us some training. I could, I'll simply say, when do you want to do it? What do you want it to include? Do you have any specific topics? And if you say no, do whatever you think's best, I'll say, okay, we'll see you there. Simple, we could do it in person, if it's around here, or on Zoom if you have people all over the place. And then if you need a lot more, uh, happy to offer like 30% off of anything else you need. Like if you're pursuing like a SOC 2, or if you have a partner or potential part, uh, big contract, that could help. I'm happy to work with you. Um, but that's about it. Are there any, any questions, comments, concerns? Sir? I wanted it to sound like it meant something, like maybe a mythical creature, but it really means absolutely nothing in no language. So it can be whatever you want, you know, or maybe one day we'll come up with a mascot. But I, and I was also able to trademark it very easily <laughs> by myself. So that was cool. And it, really it just, it sounds the way it looks to me. I mean, I think, I mean, maybe someone would say Yastis or something. I don't know, it's just Yastis. <laughs> Cybersecurity? Yes, it is. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, are there any other questions? So, how do you know if the antivirus is doing what it's supposed to at 3 a.m.? How would you check it? it uh, that's how I have mine set up, and I generally just go in the day after and just make sure that it, it shows complete, uh, you know, the date that it was completed. I look at the findings and then make sure that it's scanned roughly amount of the files that I know I have on the system, right? Like, if you know all in you have 100,000 files and it says, you're good to go, we scanned 10 files, something's probably wrong. So it's, it doesn't have to be the most elaborate thing. And Microsoft Defender, for home use especially, or for really small business, it's, it's pretty solid. I've seen a lot of multi-billion multi dollar companies using that because they have the home version, but they also have the enterprise grade solution as part of Microsoft 365 platform. It's pretty solid. And if it's like a cloud, like if it's a big company or you're using Microsoft 365, then you can see the logs. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. this is what got scanned. If you have Sentinel or some other stuff that can tell you, like, oh, we found something, you should probably look into it. Oh. Yes. That, that, that goes into, like I said, that was a list of 10 things, but number 11 with a lot of us working remote, a big one, very big one, is to consider using Microsoft mobile device management. Because if, you're, if you have a bring your own device policy to where a comp, an employee can use their iPhone and access your systems, okay, great, but just you gotta keep in mind that your company data, your, your client data, might be intermingled with that person's personal data. And without having that mobile device management software, you don't know. And in, in cybersecurity, anything you don't know, you have to assume it's bad. When you're doing an assessment, if someone can't prove it to you, it's bad. We need proof. Can't, th there's no trust me bro in this to do it right. And to your point you just raised, uh, well, I can't think of the name of the software right off, but when you have it um, set up, if that employee becomes disgruntled and leaves, you have the ability to delete only that portion. Because there's, there's a need to make sure that you don't delete, if you have that BYOB, that you don't delete any of that personal information, but you do have the legal right to delete your company information. Are you thinking of Microsoft Intune? Yeah, that's, that's the one most companies use because Microsoft has such large market share in, for enterprise consumers. Um, so that, that does exactly what he said. Along with that, something to consider is virtual, virtualized desktop, right? So. What that is, that kind of goes hand in hand with MDM. There are some solutions that are two in one, but most of them aren't. Like Microsoft Solutions, not. So you have MDM, Microsoft uh, Mobile Device Management, to control it, like, like you said, to delete your data when, when that employee leaves or something goes wrong. But the virtual desktop is kind of nice because the, from the employee's perspective, that's on their phone. And when they click in there, it opens a new world to your company network. It's truly keeping, when, keeping the data separated like a company network, because say you have like 10 employees and some of them were issued a laptop, some of them brought their own, you don't know what's really going on. So, 
just try to know what's going on with the data, you know? If you don't know, assume it's bad, and just do something about it before something goes wrong. Carlos. Yeah, uh, when it comes to your incident response plan, does that also include a uh, recovery plan as well? Like the after effects of like Yeah, the yeah, it's, uh, it should include everything relevant to get your systems back the way they, they were. Some companies, the bigger ones, like in the government, we would maintain a continuity of operations plan. So say, a, a, I wouldn't expect any company around here to do that, but if you're a company like Microsoft, you almost certainly have that. And we don't want to look at cyber risk as a standalone thing. We don't want to let the IT manager be the one to worry about that. Cyber risk is business risk. It's not. So if your board or whoever looks at your other risks, like the economy, they need to be looking at cyber risk. It doesn't have to be all day, every day, but they need to be in, in tune. They need to be locked in and getting updates from whoever that is, if it's not someone on their team directly. So it's pretty often compensated. Yeah, for, for smaller companies, I would say it should all be in that one document. So the basically have like, like coaches in NFL or NBA, what they have to play for. So Absolutely. The Cybersecurity. Yeah. I'm from California, right? And I grew up on airplanes, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I, I did move to um, Dallas, and then there were hurricanes, right? And I didn't like the pre like hurricane or whatever bad weather warning because before it happened, it was just words crazy, 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 crazy. But for earthquakes, it just happened and then it happened. Then you deal with my point is this is that um, you need to have a playbook for a life, natural disaster, or whatever, because it, it may not be cybersecurity. So as he says, if God forbid an earthquake happened in, in Vegas, you don't want to be on Google yeah. trying to figure out yeah. what you should be doing. You should already have a playbook. Google don't work. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. So to give you an example of that, like say you're on Microsoft Cloud, and your, account, you're in a, your company right here. So which zone are you can pick? They have different zones around, different regions. You're probably gonna pick the zone where you are because that's quicker, right? It takes a shorter part, amount of time to get from your computer to that server, so that's good to do. But what you also wanna do is have it mirrored to the East Coast, perhaps, as a backup. So that way, if the Microsoft Data Center is obliterated for some reason, your data is still good to go, right? And what you could do is, if you want to take it even further, is maybe make your backup on a Google Cloud. So that way it's syncing to some other cloud. That way if Microsoft is completely corrupted, then you don't have to worry about it. Because when you're setting up your backups, you want to think through this, like kind of like wargame it, and think, is there any segment, anything, any risk that could take out my primary system and my backup at once? And if there is, then you, that's, not really, that's not a true backup. That's more like a synchronization tool. And then last thing on backups, iCloud, which a lot of us use, that's not a true backup. Microsoft OneDrive, that's not a true backup. A true backup is when you delete it from your phone and then it's still in your backup. Whereas your iCloud, if you delete it from your phone, it's gone from all your devices. It's a synchronization method. And their employees will even tell you that. Fortunately, like literally this month, Microsoft is working on that to come out with a true backup option as part of their cloud offering. So that, that's gonna be really good because there's, there's a lot of companies out there that think they have a backup that don't. So, uh, any, any questions? Could you put your information back up there, the first one? Oh. Oh, maybe. <laughs> Let's see what happens. <laughs> oh, yes, service in here is notoriously bad. My phone never works, right? But uh, uh, if you want to connect, uh, I'll pull out my LinkedIn. It just had my name. Um, yeah, that's true. Y A S T I S. Yeah, my comp company has a page on there too. And on on the website we have a contact form, so any method is fine. 
you know. What are your thoughts on uh, Microsoft taking over the world? You know, they're, they're, they have Endpoint now, they got like, their security stack. Like, they own LinkedIn. They're, they're, like, taking they own over gaming. So why, why even get a separate third party and just go all Microsoft? That's what they would like. Um, I think in many ways it's better because to have an integrated solution, but also to you have to account for the the, the downfalls of that integrated solution, like keep your backup separate. Uh, what do you think about it? I'm like indifferent because yeah, I like the like what you're saying. Like there's a lot of things that are integrated, so if I block it in Microsoft, it's going to block it on their phones yeah. now versus going to the other security tool. But then I'm also scared that if something happens to Microsoft and we lose everything because everything's integrated with Microsoft. And then you don't have as much visibility yeah. because Microsoft is not really 100 percent security focused. They're just very broad. So some security yeah. tools are way better than Microsoft. It's true. Me personally, between my laptop, smartphone, and tablet, I always have them a different brand. People are like, why don't you just get the same brand? It works better. I'm like, no, because it's one risk could possibly knock out all three. And and also I like to see what's happening in these different you know environments. So you can just stay current. And if you, especially if you find it interesting. Yeah. So, anyone else have anything? Well, so you're basically saying you, you're worried about a single point of failure. Yeah, you definitely want to avoid avoid that single point of failure because in in cybersecurity they have this thing they call the CIA triad. It includes confidentiality, which just means no one can no one can know what's going on. Like if we close the door, that's better confidentiality than the open door. Then you have integrity, meaning whatever you're seeing is legitimate. No one corrupted, no one tampered with your data. And then the last one is availability. So when you need your data, is it there? Can you get to it? Uh, so they're all pretty important, but different companies have to think about this, and they, they typically do, to think, what's the most important to me? Like if I had to pick one of those, C or I or A, what do you, what's most important? If your data is not super important, like maybe you're just a reservation app to where it doesn't really matter that John Doe is going to dinner with his wife, you, want to, you, want, you probably want to focus on availability, right? You don't want it to be down. So your information is not that important, but the uptime is. So it's just something, something to think about. What did you call it again? The CIA triad? Yeah, not like the Central Intelligence Agency. I don't know what you mean, what's it called? Yeah, triads, just basically like a triangle. Yeah, yeah, that's a good that's a good foundational approach to understand that because if if that's one of the first things you, you learn in cybersecurity, it kind of makes it a little simpler because you see all the different parts and how it comes together. Uh, free cyber clinic. You have anything to add to what we spoke about? Okay. I don't know what's going on here. Let's try one more time. It's probably just a service in here. I checked this last night. So, oh. Well, small fee, I can fix it. Really? So, you, you guys, the, the co founder of Startup Vegas, the co founder of Startup Vegas, that's his business. That's why I, I support it. Peter, um, he's a great guy. Uh, uh, very supportive of entrepreneurs and uh, always happy to help. Uh, but I don't want to take up too much more of your time, so thank you all for attending. I'll stay here in case you want to like scan and connect. Or thank you. <laughs>